1865, Martin Delaney spoke before a crowd of formerly enslaved Africans and encouraged them to develop themselves economically and understand that they're racially superior, that Africans had once colonized Spain and Portugal, that it's through force we were liberated, and that it's through force we will maintain it. It's impressive in itself and more impressive for 1865. The main trouble is that the record of this speech was from a Eurasian. This speaks towards our unwillingness to keep our own records, which can be excused when the crowd are formerly enslaved and possibly illiterate, but this pattern of not keeping our own records persists. Much of the book you are reading was transcribed, sometimes through rare recordings when knowledge should be recorded frequently and quickly transcribed. This is in no way a complete speech and recorded responses to it among African listeners were, we will get the Yankee employer. Uh, that is the only man who ever told us truth. And now those white men have to work for themselves or starve or leave the country. We will not work for them anymore. Now, these are excellent responses to gain from speaking. Notice that he has a program, too. A few details to point out. The white male fashion of those days was women's fashion later. That is, white women started dressing like white men, dresses, earrings, long hair, in order to attract white men who are inherently bisexual. The Moors were not exclusively an African group, and many of those Africans were, in fact, enslaved. Research Haratin. The seed reference is very true. Many Africans back then would sow rice into their hair when they knew they had a long journey ahead. Aside from this, Baba's con concept of north over south and good and bad whites aren't consistent with the war mindset you need. While the Southerners were more foolish than the Northerner, all whites are engaged in warfare against Africans. You should be impressed that Martin Delaney properly outlines a plan for wealth generation. Truly, if Africa adopted this sort of intelligence of growing vegetables alongside trading crops, even if only to trade internally, the benefits would be enormous. It's worth noting, however, that Baba seemed to heavily desire trading with Eurasians, but again, they universally war against us. This is best illustrated in Baba's assurance on the U.S. government and how much he speaks for the U.S. government and how the U.S. government is on the side of Africans. Yet unbeknownst to him, Reconstruction ended with a shock. Moreover, the white soldier who reports this speech was sent by the U.S. government to spy on him and said in his notes that the U.S. government's intention was for Africans to continue working for their former enslavers and was outraged at Martin Delaney not agreeing with his sentiment at all. I think the last and most important detail was that 200,000 armed Africans was supposed to be the deterrent from enslavement. This speaks to the power of standing armies, but that was gone, and Africans in America, like those globally, become the only people who expect to be protected by the goodwill of their enemies. Martin Delaney was amazingly bold, but in the game of war and nations, you'll need to step up if you want to live to your potential. Now, without further ado, this is Advice to a Formerly Enslaved Crowd by Martin Delaney, as read by Onita Se Kumat. And as available, I should say, in the Book of Power. It was only a war policy of the U.S. government to declare the enslaved of the South free knowing that the whole power of the South laid in the possession of the enslaved Africans. But I want you to understand that we would not have become free had we not armed ourselves and fought out our independence. Again, we would not have become free had we not armed ourselves and fought out our independence. That's why if I had been enslaved, I would have been the most troublesome and not to be conquered by any threat or punishment. I would have not worked, and no one would have dared to come near me. I would have struggled for life or death, and would have thrown fire and sword between them. I know you have been good, only too good. I was told by a friend of mine that when owned by a man and put to work on the field, he laid quietly down and had just looked out for the overseer to come along. Then he pretended to work very hard. But he confessed to me that he never had done a fair day's work for his enslaver. And so he was right. So I would have done the same, and all of you ought to have done the same. People say that you are too lazy to work, 
that you have no intelligence to get on for yourselves without being guided and driven to the work by overseers. I say it is a lie, and a blasphemous lie, and I will prove it to, to be so. I'm going to tell you now what you are worth. And so you know, Christopher Columbus landed here in 1492. They came here only for the purpose to dig gold, gather precious pearls, diamonds, and all sorts of jewels, only for the proud aristocracy of white Spaniards and Portuguese to adorn their persons, to have brooches on, for their breasts, earrings for their ears, bracelets for their ankles, and rings for their limbs and fingers. They found here Amerindians Indians whom they obliged to dig and work and slave for them, but they found out that they died way too fast and cannot stand the work. In course of time, they had taken some Africans along with them and put them to work. They would stand it. They could stand it. And yet the whites say they are superior to our race, though they cannot stand it. At the present day, in some of the eastern parts of Spain, the Spaniards there, having been once conquered by the black race, have black eyes, black hair, black complexion. They have African blood in them. The work was so profitable, which, they, which those poor blacks did, that in the year 1502, Charles V gave permission to import into America yearly 4,000 blacks. The profit of these sales was so immense that afterwards even the Virgin Queen of England and James II took part in the capturing and were accumulating great wealth for the treasury of their government. And so you have always been the means of riches. I tell you, I have been all over Africa, and if I was born there, no, and if I was born there, and I tell you as I told the Geographical Faculty of London, those people there are a well-driving class of cultivators, and I never saw or heard of one of our brethren there to travel without taking seeds with him as much as he can carry and to sow it wherever he goes to or to exchange it with his brethren. So you ought further to know that all the spices, cotton, rice, and coffee have only been brought over by you from the land of our brethren. Your enslavers who lived in opulence kept you to hard work by some contemptible being called overseer who chastised and beat you whenever he pleased, while your enslaver lived in some northern town or in Europe to squander away the wealth only you acquired for him. He never earned a single dollar in his life. You men and women, every one of you around me, made thousands and thousands of dollars for your enslaver. Only you were the means for your enslavers to lead the ideal and inglorious life and to give his children the education which he denied to you for fear you may awake to conscience. If I look around me, I tell you all the houses of this island and in Beaufort, they are all familiar to my eye. They are the same structures which I have met with in Africa. They have all been made by the Africans. You can see it by such exteriors. I tell you that white men cannot teach you anything and they cannot make them because they have not the brain to do it. At least I mean the Southern people. Oh. The Yankees, they are smart. Now tell me, from all you have heard from me, are you not worth anything? Are you those men whom they think Amon only created as a curse and to be enslaved, whom they do not consider their equals? As I said, before the Yankees are smart, there are good ones and bad ones. The good ones, if they are good, they are very good. If they are bad, they are very bad. But the worst and most contemptible and even worse than even your enslavers were are those Yankees who hired themselves as overseers. Believe not in those school teachers, emissaries, a spiritualists, and agents because they never tell you the truth. And I particularly warn you against those cotton agents who come honey-mouthed unto you, their only intent being to make profit by your inexperience. If there is a man who comes to you who will meddle with your affairs, send him to one of your more enlightened brothers who will ask him what he is, what business he seeks with you, katha wa katha. Believe none but those agents who are sent out by the U.S. government to enlighten and guide you. I am an officer in the service of the U.S. government in order to aid a general here who has, only, who has been only lately appointed assistant commander from South Carolina. When their chief justice was down here to speak to you, some of those malicious and abominable New York papers derived from it that he only seeks to be elected by you as president. I have no such ambition. I let them have for a president a white or a black one. I don't care who it be. It may be who has a mind to, 
I shall not be intimidated whether by threats or imprisonment, and no power will keep me from telling you the truth. So I express myself, even at Charleston, the hotbed of those scoundrels, your old enslavers, without fear or reluctance. So I will come to the main purpose for which I have come to see you. As before, the whole South depended upon you. Now the whole country will depend upon you. I give you an advice how to get along. Get up a community and get all the lands you can if you cannot get any singly. Grow as much vegetable, vegetables, cattle, kata as you want for your family. On the other part of the land, you cultivate rice and cotton. Now, for instance, one acre will grow a crop of cotton of $90. Now, a land with 10 acres will bring $900 every year. If you cannot get the land all yourself, the community can, and so you can divide the profit. There is a tobacco, for instance. Virginia is the great place for tobacco. There are whole squares at Dublin and Liverpool named after some place of tobacco notoriety. So you can see what enormous value your labor was to the benefits of your enslavers. Now you cannot, now you understand that I want you to be the producers of this country. It is the wish of the government for you to be so. We will send friends to you who will further instruct you how to come to the end of your wishes. You see that by so adhering to our views, you will become a wealthy and powerful population. Now I look around me and notice a man, barefooted, covered with rags and dirt. Now I ask, what is the man doing? For whom is he working? I hear that he works for a farmer for 30 cents a day. I tell you, that must not be. That would be cursed enslavement once again. I will not have it. The government will not have it. And the government shall hear about it. I will tell the government. I tell you, your enslavement is over and shall never return again. We now have 200,000 of our men well, in, well drilled in arms and used to warfare. And I tell you, it is with you and them that your enslavement shall not come back again. If you are determined, it will not return again. Now go to work, and in short time, I will see you again. The other friends will come to show you how to begin. Have your fields in good order and well tilled and planted. And when I pass the fields and see a land well planted and well cared for, then I may be sure from the look of it that it belongs to a free African. And when I see a field thinly planted and little cared for, then I may think it belongs to some man who works it with enslaved Africans. The government decided that you shall keep one third of the produce of the crops from your employer. So he makes three dollars, you will have to get one dollar out of it for your labor. The other day, some plantation owners in Virginia and Maryland offered $5 a month for your labor, but it was indignantly rejected by the commissioner for the government. All right, thank you for listening. That was Martin Delaney, uh, formal, formerly advi formal advice, advice to formerly enslaved Africans. It's available in the Book of Power. A little bit of editing was going on, uh, only to keep it more modern or more to our you know liberation but the whole idea is to give you material that you can recite that you can read that you can learn from there's much to learn from this this was 1865 in the United States of America uh, and and this was advice straight to enslaved Africans in front of a white audience this was Martin Delaney a real black man, somebody, and this is this is an exclusive, unpublished article that, you know, a spy of the U.S. government reported to the U.S. government, and you know somebody found it, transcribed it, and here I have it published in the Book of Power, along with many other good gems. Get this, read it to your child, have your child read it, read it to your your teenagers, read it to your friends, your colleagues. This is Martin Delaney telling you how we can liberate ourselves, whether in America, whether in the Caribbean, whether in Africa, whether in Europe, wherever, Asia, who cares? This is how you can get free. And, and, and I outline it. I'll outline everything in the book. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. This is the pro-black perspective on KWAZ Radio. Uh, peace and blessings. Nitaya too.